In the interest of time, we'll simply start um, because there's uh, lots of stuff to cover in this uh, deck. Um, really trying to describe open daylight from a slightly different angle and perspective uh, for you. Um, we'll cover a few of uh, the different things open daylight is useful for in the bigger context of, uh, of the whole um, kind of uh, open stack uh, reference. Many times in this conference, uh, we are looking um, how we're doing as a community, uh, what a specific project is doing, what do I have in this release or in that release. What I'm trying to cover here is um, something that is a little bit different, trying to um, kind of frame the boundary of what Open Daylight is doing in the bigger context of the whole stack. And we'll use some of the favorite um, use cases that have been pointed out by other folks here um, this week in order to do that. So just for an appetizer here uh, or to wake you up after uh, lunch or whatever, we'll talk about uh, service chaining as an example. But uh, really, the bigger context is how applications are interacting with the infrastructure. Then we'll zoom into the different roles Open Daylight uh, can play, which is the key theme of this talk. And um, look at uh, now that we put some ideas behind how all of the different pieces of uh, the stack are there for us, when we put it all together, what do we really have today? What we still need to do in order to um, get more? And the last subject is going to be specific to um, infrastructure awareness at higher layers and the benefit it provides, and then wrap it up with a call to actions. So this is just to uh, provide some example of how things are uh, potentially being used here. Uh, this uh, diagram is taken from uh, one of the um, Etsy uh, reference architectures. You see the different VNFs being connected up there. And um, the whole idea is I need some network activity, some network boxes that are going to sit between the uh, two endpoints. We want to carry with us some um, insight to the fact that service chaining is not really limited to telco or to cloud or to enterprise. Lots of the things we are doing here in this community are actually equivalently relevant to different market segments, even though the deployment and the ad adoption of that may vary um, on time. But when you look at telco, for instance, I think the uh, reasons people are interested in service chaining are kind of almost evident. You have different users. They have uh, different contracts. You may want to do stuff uh, per flow. For example, uh, telco has different types of network. Uh, they deploy stuff in different uh, kind of topologies, which by itself may create a need to do service chain either restricted to a topology, cross topologies, and so on and so forth. Um, in cloud, where all of this was born, it comes pretty naturally that you would like to have um, some firewalls, load balancer, when optimizers, whatever. And even you may want to think, even though um, some of your favorite cloud uh, management systems do not support it today that you want to bring your own. So I really like that firewall with that configuration. I really want that load balancer that is optimized for my application. I would be very happy to deploy it. Can I do that not as a VM, but as actually a privileged function in the network that the rest of the infrastructure would really be able to identify and, as such, provided some privileges to the network. And we will touch on that. What does that mean to get privileged access to some of, of the network stuff? And in enterprise, um, similar, user, uh, similar use cases. And why are people looking into that? For reasons that have been already discussed, so I'm not going to uh, get into this right now. But 
I want to take a step back first and look at uh, kind of, if you want, something that we refer to as software defined infrastructure that you are starting to hear more about in the industry, I think, right now. I just actually, a couple of days ago, so um, somebody is already organizing an SDI conference later this, this fall. And the idea is not just to look at network, but to look at network, compute, and storage in some sort of holistic fashion. Everything is driven by cloudification, which really means automation, which really means the agility, um, the ability to move uh, workloads um, at the speed of a mouse click based on a momentary needs. And, and when I start looking at things that way and looking at the application and then the different layers of, uh, there's no pointer here, I think. Maybe there is, no, <laughs> that was the wrong, wrong thing to push. Um, there is recovery. Okay, not too much damage. Don't push buttons that you don't know what they're going to do um, is the lesson. So anyhow, uh, there are layers in, in the infrastructure. We, we are going to visit those orchestration. The control is, uh, thank you. Oh, is, is that the same? It's, it's gonna work with this? Oh, oh okay, oh, okay. Thank you, Asaf. Okay. Okay, so um, the layers, uh, the different layers is actually gonna be what we are going to talk about. Um, and you see at the bottom that ideally, if I could organize all of my resources in a pool, and at one moment, this box in my infrastructure is more network centric, and another moment, it's gonna be more storage centric, that would be uh, very interesting. It's gonna lead to my ability at the business level to drive agility, to drive uh, lower cost, lower uh, capex and opex and so on. But we have some challenges before we get to this wonderful picture. What is the right way for those applications to interact with this tech and specifically with whatever your infrastructure happens to be? Um, just to paint two extremes, I could say, um, well, um, because I like uh, scalability as much as I can get it, I'd like to uh, place it anywhere. I don't have one homogeneous infrastructure. Um, so what I would love to do is create those applications completely agnostic of the infrastructure. What do you think that's gonna do? Is that a viable option? Nobody is, uh, okay. We could make this interactive, guys, if you want to. <laughs> so um, what's gonna happen in that case is that you're going to also lose some optimization. Optimization is not here for the sake of performance only. Optimization here is for the sake of the bottom line because if I do not have my infrastructure running as efficient as I can, it means that the cost per unit of compute, I'm using that in a most generic sense, is gonna be high, so I'm not gonna be able to compete in the market. So we, another way of saying that is that what we have seen in the industry originally was, oh, I can do virtualization, wonderful. Uh, I wasn't able to do it yesterday. But we are going into this era where it's not about just my ability to do service chaining or, or NFV, we are going into this era where it's also about my ability to compete successfully in that, in that market. For that, I need to also be efficient. So when I create my applications in a way that is completely agnostic of the infrastructure, I'm also going to, to put or leave some performance on the floor and I'm going to regret it later and I'll show you some results by a third party in this talk as well. If I dial it all the way to the other extreme and I say, oh, I'm going to make my application extremely specific to the infrastructure I'm using, obviously what's gonna happen, it's not portable, I'm changing the infrastructure tomorrow, I cannot scale easily. So we need to find some happy in between. And that happy in between is this line that we are referring to as, as policy, some language that as an industry we need to develop. And SFC, service chaining, is one example of a use case we all care about um, that is trying to do that. 
In order to achieve that, there are two arrows over here, and we are going to spend five minutes talking about them in the next few slides. For that communication, now that I'm sure everybody is convinced now applications do need to have some dialogue with the infrastructure, so for that communication to happen, we need something that comes up from the infrastructure and tells the orchestrator and the controller, or ODL in this case, um, what I'm capable of doing and what's available right now, and something needs to come from the top down and tell me what is this piece of compute trying to do. And we'll, uh, we'll change pace a little bit and, and run a little bit faster um, as you see the basic uh, concepts here. So the model is very simple. The implementation is going to be a little bit more complicated. I actually am trying to do in each of those layers a comparison between what is the service model, which have two inputs to it, uh, my specific workloads and somebody who runs that infrastructure have their input. And, and what do I have in the infrastructure? I'm trying to compare them and I'm trying to use what I know latest about that infrastructure. Very simple. Um, when we start putting the details behind it, it's not going to be that simple. There is another principle that we want to use as I was describing the two extremes of uh, completely agnostic fully um, linked or specific to an infrastructure, which I'm trying to exemplify here with these um, two triangles. The policy obviously comes from the top and becomes very narrow and specific as we reach the bottom. So a specific piece of infrastructure really needs to know only what it needs to know. Otherwise, it's not going to scale. The details of the infrastructure, and we'll talk about the uh, enhanced uh, platform awareness uh, work that we are doing, that obviously is rich in detail at the bottom and becomes a little bit more specific at the top, as I don't really want to, just a second, I don't really want to overload my orchestration or other decision-making um, mechanisms with too many details. I want to be extremely picky and take those relevant details and only those. Question. Yes, we are getting there. So um, if we want to talk about the ideal state before we get into a specific example of a policy, um, there are many things that we may need to change in an existing reference that for this, the case of this talk, I'm referring to OpenStack, OpenDaylight, and Open vSwitch. Uh, we may want to develop as an industry a policy API layer. For those of you who are more conversant in OpenStack, there are multiple projects over there. Uh, the scheduler we have right now in OpenStack is really compute-centric, is really not aware of um, network capabilities or constraints and storage as well. Um, in the image, I may want to have some hints as to what that workload really needs so I know where to place it. A specific example would be just generic compute versus some load balancer. A load balancer may need something different than, than compute. Um, lots of work happening in, in Neutron, not making as much progress as we would like to see. Uh, Silometer and specifically Nochi would be useful to provide feedback as to the status of my infrastructure. We'll talk more about what I have in uh, Open Daylight, what we are doing as a community there. And Open Daylight role here is really to um, sit in between the orchestrator and, and the lower level where the enforcement is supposed to take place and do some interpretation, do some instantiation, and expense that um, so that we know what action to take in the infrastructure. Okay, so am I done when I'm just talking OpenStack, uh, Open Daylight, and OVS? Not really. I'm not going to, in this talk, not going to go in that direction, but if we are talking about NFV, we need to take into account um, really the whole stack, um, as you could see on the lower right side, and really 
try to employ the same principles over there of these two triangles, these two arrows, I may need even at the higher layers to expose some of the capabilities so I end up deploying the VNFs in the right place. So I end up providing scalability, whether within the VNF or intra-VNF or having uh, some geo requirements or whatever you have, you may wanna have some awareness of the infrastructure there too. So, the progress we have made is that whether you have telco uh, use case on the left or cloud um, on the right, we are as an industry working on open source converging around OpenStack and Open Daylight working in tandem together with a popular vSwitch in order to uh, deliver those uh, mechanisms. Um, and, and so now we could start zooming in into what Open Daylight is doing. Um, I'm just quoting a slide from uh, yesterday's keynote, and that gives me the justification to use um, NFV service chaining as a good example here, because this is really the way people are using today Open Daylight. So if we really are trying to put the whole stack together for these three use cases, and um, I'm just highlighting the key actors. Uh, this uh, illegible uh, piece of the puzzle here is uh, the work we are all doing together. It's the latest model for um, lithium uh, open daylight. Um, we would need the following things if we are really trying to deploy that. We would need some policy that is going to tell me um, what is my application going to do? An NFV may be composed of multiple virtual machines. Um, where do I, what's the connectivity requirement? What's the compute requirements? They need to be together. They need to be on different HA, uh, different zones for HA reasons. Um, this piece is gonna scale. This piece doesn't need any scalability. Go instantiate another complete copy of this. Um, when you run out of resources, uh, when this piece fails, do it so and so on and so forth. There needs to be, and hopefully, uh, Asaf, that answers some of your question. There needs, we need to have a way to communicate that in a standard fashion, and then it needs to work uh, down all, all the stacks. Um, we are creating overlays. How do we piece that together? How service chaining is working, um, and all, all the other pieces. So let's talk about what ODL is supposed to do in this uh, rather complicated set of uh, requirements and, and mechanisms. And I'm simply highlighting few of those. Um, note the legend. Um, some of these we could kind of claim as a community that we already have. Some of that we probably need to work on. It's not that those that we kind of have are done. <laughs> There's work required uh, there too, but you could definitely play with it, enhance it, and so on. So we expect out of an SDN controller to have um, some uh, topology, sense of topology for underlay and overlay in the case of open daylight and some of the stats that are going to tell me up, down uh, level of utilization. We expect an SDN controller to play the role of connecting uh, a VM, and I'm just using one way of packaging applications. We are all aware of other, other ways, but right now let's keep it simple. Uh, how a VM is really connected to a network, and that could be maybe an overlay, again, just to keep it simple. Um, we would like to create um, some service chaining maybe in that policy also says something about can talk to this guy, cannot talk to that guy. Uh, we may want to consider the concept of a group because what is a VNF? It's a bunch of, uh, of VMs. Um, different people have different views of what that group needs to be and what is the relationship between its different members and how different groups are related to each other. But inside Open Daylight today, we do have group-based policy. Uh, we do have SFC, and the good news is that out of uh, lithium, they actually are even uh, communicating to each other, which allows me to do some meaningful uh, things uh, with them. 
I'm also claiming, based on, on the long preamble um, to this talk, that um, I want to do, from the infrastructure, I want to have two mechanisms. I want to have a capable and available. I want to know that for this uh, piece of compute, this infrastructure would be a good match. For another piece of compute, maybe another piece of my infrastructure. Um, but I also need to know what is available, not only for compute, but also for network. If I'm trying to place a firewall that I expect to get five gig of performance out of, and I'm connecting that on a one gig NIC, it's not going to work that well. If I'm going to um, work with a vSwitch that at this point is overloaded or is architected such that its performance is capped, and I'm, uh, well, compute is available on this platform, no problem. Memory is available on this platform, no problem. But the vSwitch is going to slow me down. And we also need to acknowledge the additional complexity. When you start the game, everything is available. Your initial placement for the first virtual machine on the platform, well, we could say it's not a, the most critical decision you're going to make, even though I'm going to claim, be careful with this one too. But when you start adding more virtual machines to that um, piece of infrastructure, now we are subject to all sorts of interesting, potential, damaging um, interference in a way that your performance is not what you thought you were going to get. And for that, we need to have some isolation. For that, we need to have some enforcement that happens on the platform. And actually, I would also love it if my infrastructure would be able to say, as the orchestrator above me, that says, oh, I thought that should work just fine, is not aware of this, I may want to give him a hint, hey, you know, that's maybe not the best decision you made today. So um, we need to, to do some work, and I'll show you some early results. Um, security has come up uh, multiple times. I'm not going to talk about it right now. And uh, the concept of network-assisted um, VM placement is what I'm talking about when I'm saying be aware of the vSwitch performance, uh, be aware of uh, your network infrastructure performance, be aware of your network in general. You may put um, your uh, appliance here and your VM there, and you'll be surprised that they are having some difficulty to communicate. OK. So um, with that in mind, I also want to um, bring to your attention some work that the ODL community was doing um, since the last release. And this has to do with the concept of uh, S3P. I think that at this point, it is fair to say, um, and please challenge um, any, any statement like that if, if you like, that uh, we are, as a community, making good progress on, on those promises. The first thing that we needed to do was to stabilize that. So this is not just an open source project, and God knows what happens when you're really trying to use that. It is really stable. It's going to work. Um, however, because we have uh, more than 40 projects, it is challenging to make sure that everything works. So we need to make sure that we have use cases that we have selected and those have been tested properly. And the work that we are doing from the board, from the TSC, from everybody that is really doing the work and committing code is to make sure that we are addressing all of those efforts. And we also chose two use cases um, in, for lithium, network virtualization and service training, which, again, in the surveys that um, the marketing folks are doing, you see that these are the popular ways people are using uh, the platform. And I'll challenge you towards the end of this talk to provide some other examples of use cases that you think this community needs to actually go and, and deal with. So let's talk about the first role, kind of what would seem as very benign and simple, of course. Um, Let's connect a virtual machine to the network. I'm using an old slide from 
um, the way Neutron looks at it, you may want to draw your attention to the two dashed boxes here, the kind of purplish and, and, and the red at the bottom. The distinction there is really who owns that piece. Um, the one at the top is really owned by uh, Nova. What we are using in, in our case is, is Libvirt, uh, KVM as an example. Again, everything is, is as an example because we're doing reference architecture. We are not shipping this for product from Intel point of view. And it connects uh, the virtual machine through Linux bridges to uh, the pretty elaborate two bridges that we used to have in, uh, in Open vSwitch. And so the way the connectivity works is kind of in two phases. Um, you're placing a, a virtual machine. Obviously, you need to boot, and I'm not going to go into this whole lengthy process, and how did I get the vSwitch there, and how did I get the right vSwitches? There's lots of complexity. I'm trying to simplify that because I want to compare and contrast the way it works with open daylight to the way it works without open daylight. So this is with no open daylight. I'm simply going from uh, uh, Nova is, is configuring um, those uh, VMs and, and connects them. And, and um, the OVS plugin in Neutron is really about configuring the vSwitch in the right way, connecting it to the right network that is recognized by Neutron, and then making that connection here between the ways the VM are plugged in to the way uh, the vSwitch is going to, um, to work. When we, and there are multiple modes here, uh, you could read it offline, I'm not gonna have enough time to get into all the details. When we are moving in the direction of open daylight, it becomes um, a little bit different. Open daylight is now the entity that controls the vSwitch. Um, in, not only in the open daylight case, we have moved to a little bit simpler model for um, the vSwitch, um, there was a talk yesterday, and I'm going to refer to it in a second again, about the way DPDK is, uh, is used to change and enhance the data plane of, uh, of the server. And the change that happens here is that uh, while we have uh, Nova using the additional information about what the infrastructure is capable. So I chose an infrastructure that is going to give me the optimal uh, results. It is now communicating to the NOS side of, of this uh, bridge. ODL now steps into the picture. It needs to um, control that uh, vSwitch instead of um, the work that used to be done by um, the OVS mechanism driver that was not uh, anticipating the use of open daylight underneath that. And uh, I, I also could have other things that come to play, like uh, policy. Um, I have some uh, different modes. The last one here is work that is happening in the open vSwitch that allows you to actually, if you had the right piece of hardware here, to move some of this processing, including policy, down to a piece of hardware. To put things in reference, um, when you use DPDK, this architecture changes a little bit. And the slides that, that you uh, saw yesterday in the talk, if you attended that, and if not, you could uh, probably fetch it uh, online in a few days when it becomes available. Uh, we had another talk that was really covering the details of how DPDK works with open daylight, the changes that are happening uh, on the data plane, as well as the benefits from performance. And as we said, performance is not for fun. Performance is to allow us to compete. So DPDK has uh, multiple modes. Uh, the one that was used yesterday uh, was the one on the right side with shared memory, which has its roots in the way Telco used to um, use it. Um, in those cases, one entity controlled the box, so sharing memory was not a security uh, or isolation issue for anyone. But as we anticipate, people want to use that in more of a cloud uh, style, where I want to have multiple tenants, where I do not have the trust in between them. Uh, we are also working on, on Virt.io here as a way where 
there's no shared memory, so you are really adhering to the classical isolation constraints or requirement, and you are still not leaving too much performance um, on, on the floor. The other uh, way to look at that, or the other project that I was talking about in open uh, vSwitch is uh, the, the uh, this is, you could think of this slide as kind of a summary of the different modes uh, one could work with a vSwitch. You could work with uh, a vSwitch directly, everything is in, in software. Uh, you have the choice, um, user mode, uh, kernel mode, depending on the one you're choosing. You could uh, enhance that using uh, DPDK uh, with or without a vSwitch. And the last mode here that I just want to bring to your attention is the mode that I actually, in conjunction with the open vSwitch, in a way that is A, coordinated, and B, seamless, so it doesn't require you to do anything special, I could actually take a piece of the processing for switching, for policy, for enforcement that happens in the vSwitch, put it in a capable hardware, and now I gain actually even few cycles back, make my platform even more um, optimized and available to run the code that I really need. So these are just examples of what it takes to run a vSwitch and create a network virtualization with open daylight, and some of the code contributions that we have done has amount to just enabling all of that to happen. But this is obviously just uh, one case. Let's uh, explore what happens when we are trying to do um, service chaining and, and specifically using NSH. So uh, how many folks here are familiar with the NSH architecture? Can I skip this slide or spend a little bit? Uh, so we have Paul Quinn in the room, and he's uh, the co-editor of the NSH. Uh, your hand up. So um, if you have questions, you could ask him later. Uh, I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, take a few seconds here to uh, describe it for those who didn't raise their hand. So we start with some classification, and here are two very simple chains that I could go and, and employ to serve my needs. I could go between different uh, service functions in a predetermined order. I could actually fork as well. I can have one service uh, function that serves more than uh, one uh, service chain. The architecture is very, very flexible in, in that way. The elements of the architecture are right here. When you cross that imaginary domain, uh, your classifier could be logical, could be part of the vSwitch in open daylight the way we do it. It is actually uh, running as part of the vSwitch, but what we have right now is a basic classifier. You could obviously bring your own and, and create a more uh, sophisticated one. Uh, for instance, you could use uh, DPI uh, if you uh, needed to be that way, but DPI could also be one of the service functions. You don't necessarily need to do it as the first step. But once you did it, um, we would like to uh, go into SFC encapsulation, which in our case, um, ODL is going to be NSH. And this element of the architecture, the SFF, is the one that is the uh, traffic um, or, or the um, Highway Patrol, if you want, um, and this is the entity that um, launches the traffic towards the relevant um, service functions. Um, those could be aware or unaware of NSH, and everything comes back to this guy. And this is the guy who's going to also allow us to scale. He is co going to communicate with other SFF as, as uh, the need uh, may be. Um, Few more comments here. I, I want to um, make sure we have enough time to cover everything and leave a few minutes for questions too. Um, the way this magic happens is really by inserting um, two things here. This is your favorite VXLAN that um, had to be enhanced for a very simple reason. Uh, the original VXLAN didn't have a next protocol header, so you could not point to another header that we need here which is the NSH. 
The NSH has a few things that it does. It has the um, notion of the spy, which is really whatever service chaining you chose for the day. It also going to tell you where you are in, in that service chain and when you exhausted it and maybe you had an error and you should drop at this point. And it also allows you to carry some metadata and I provide you some example of how the metadata could be used to save you compute, to make you more agile and so on. So a few more technical comments on this and then we'll see how we play with this in open daylight. Sure. So Kostas is asking, does the NSH header stay intact? Um, the beauty of the architecture is that every service function could actually also be a classifier if you want. And because I have a firewall, then obviously I learned something about the traffic. Um, so I may add my learning or say I add DPI, I can add my learning into this and change the metadata. I could also, as service function number three, make a decision uh, based on some interaction with the control plane that, um, oh, at this point, instead of going here to number N, I would go here to, to number two. If I go to number two, number two is part of a different chain. So I'm going to change the chain number if you, if you want. So the short answer is absolutely, you, this, the, it has the flexibility for whatever you, you may want to do with it. And you can have also NSA time. So that's an interesting topic that came up last week in, in, in the IETF. There are, Right, and, and you, you'll find what happens uh, recently in the IETF is that some of the Etsy guys, some of the telcos are becoming more interested in this and starting to work either in the IRTF where they have NFV um, research group or directly with the service function work group and the need to uh, map NF, uh, NFV uh, forwarding graph to SFC is going to also um, behoove us to look into hierarchy in SFC. This is one of the drafts that the work group is considering right now. That that's that's a control plane question. But uh, but the SFF actually in its uh, role as um, the highway patrol here um, needs to know um, what service function I have on this node and um, what service functions for this chain are gonna be found where so I could actually do my job. So um, I need to switch gears here a little bit. So two comments on, on this slide. Um, you have a choice, uh, depending on the scalability, by the way, that you need, you could deploy this as uh, the protocol itself is transport independent. So you could have service functions that sit on different types of transport and yet they could be connected to a one useful chain based on your needs, which also means in the data center if you so choose. Um, you could implement that as two independent layers. You could actually merge it into a single overlay. And the example that we have with Open Daylight is actually on the right side. One of the things that Intel is pushing in the standard, and we are working with other folks on those standards, is really the openness and the interoperability. And Open Daylight plays a very interesting and important role here because you actually have code, you actually have bits, you could actually go, A, contribute to this, play with it, understand how the different headers are working, um, and I think that's a really good and important service that uh, we have for the community. A slide I'm uh, borrowing with pride from uh, the presentation Cisco provided just a couple of days ago uh, in the IETF is um, trying to tell you something that is rather important, and this is now open daylight specific, that the two types of policies that we had, one with um, group-based policy where you put some of your entities, VMs, in a group and, and some other in another group and you define the contract between them, what they can and cannot do together. You could think now of SFC as uh, another group like that. And actually, as I'll show you in, in the next slide, 
it's more than that. We made really good progress in, in lithium um, such that, and credit um, is for everybody who worked on this project here, uh, people from uh, Cisco, from Ericsson, from Intel as well, um, so that I can actually invoke SFC from group-based policy. And hopefully that helps you with the question of what we are talking about policy. To me, this is just an example. It's just the start of a more elaborate uh, interaction that we need to have between what applications need and how the infrastructure responds to that need. But that is a very popular use case. And so we, we have that already working in open daylight right now. Um, just a comment here to relate this to the previous slides. Um, the notions of VNFs versus VMs, so be aware of the fact that OpenStack obviously doesn't know anything about VNFs, and so that's why I'm saying, okay, it's really OpenStack and Meno, but this is a very simple diagram, just trying to tell you uh, what happens here. Um, that's a demo that, that we did, again, was referred to in another talk yesterday. So for interest of time, I'm not going to go into the details of that. Um, so now I want to start putting things together. Um, I want to leave you with some impression of, okay, what the hell do I get when I start putting things together? Um, if I want to create this kind of a graph, I'm classifying stuff, I have this kind of policy, and I have those applications. Um, at the OpenStack layer, because today it's not really a policy API, we do not have agreement in the industry how to do that. There are multiple projects, and, and new projects are popping up every OpenStack summit on how we do that. Uh, we do not have a way to simply go and say this is the way I, I need to work. As we'll go to Open Daylight, you'll see that we have much more progress in Open Daylight, and so Open Daylight actually shines in, in, in that way. Uh, we also have issues in, in Neutron uh, right now where there is no service chaining available in Neutron. I'll show you the latest and greatest on this. In Open Daylight, we have all of this uh, figured out, and we have that uh, also integrated with uh, um, the open uh, vSwitch. Okay, so here is um, a little bit uh, basic diagram just to um, try and, and stitch everything together. So I'm using a telco application. Again, it doesn't matter. Uh, there are two ways primarily I could do things right now. One way is to simply work directly with open daylight. And I could go to the SFC. It exposes its REST API. And um, then I could go to my favorite infrastructure, and um, we worked on the automation of uh, SFC towards the server, and how I would get the SFF configured, and how would I get the policy uh, in there, and uh, so on and, and, and so forth. And um, that kind of interface is going to stay there, uh, as you'll see in the next slide, um, OPNV has latched on this, and this is the way they are going to use it for now, simply because the other one, the red one, is um, still going to have some challenges to it. Work that we are doing right now was not to get um, service chaining in Neutron, but rather allow Neutron to be aware of service chaining, so that when we get the VMs and they are placed down here, and I'm, I'm simply trying to make sure the network is doing the right job. And the network is aware that this is a service function because I'm sure at this point everybody noticed from the NSH slides that service functions would love to have the NSH header because they need it in order to do their job or they need to change the metadata. How does the vSwitch know that this is a service function? Well, somebody needs to tell it. So there is work for us to do. There is benefit from having these two layers, the orchestrator and the SDN controller, simply be in sync so that when you're placing a virtual machine, Neutron, Nova is aware that that is going to play a role of a service function. And uh, I 
am going to avoid race conditions where a service function is not available and I'm already starting to spray traffic in that direction, all sorts of the little things that you really want to not get a phone call in the middle of the night. So that is the work that uh, we are trying to do right now in Neutron in order to enable that. There are many other things that are needed, as you see. I'm pointing uh, here at the bottom to that uh, blue arrow over there that is supposed to create that linkage. I also want to highlight the green arrow over there, which was the new piece that happened in lithium release that is allowing group-based policy to invoke SFC. So if you come from here and you're using Neutron APIs of open daylight, you could actually work with group-based policy, and group-based policy is going to help you um, invoke SFC on your behalf. There are other projects. Uh, we don't have time. We're not going to go there. This is for your reference to show that OPNV um, is really using those um, mechanisms that we are building over here. I want to switch to EPA, uh, spend maybe two minutes on this, and then wrap it up and have two minutes for questions, too. So um, we talked uh, about the need for the infrastructure and the application to communicate a little bit. So you would say, oh, OK, uh, this is uh, um, somebody who works for a company that happens to provide some servers here and there. What, well, do I really need something um, like that? And, and so I'm going to claim that for a bunch of reasons, you really need to do that. And I want to make it, bring it really close to home. The way to do that is to compare two different, if you want, philosophies, mentalities, ways people deploy applications in, in the real world. If you go to Amazon as an example, you don't really know uh, what is the underlying architecture for you. Uh, the workload is going to be deployed on something. Yes, it's going to do my work. The optimization is the challenge of the service provider in this case. And the kind of stack I'm going to have is most likely going to be something of that nature. And my traffic is going to have to go through all of those layers and have uh, bottlenecks. The telco community is coming from an embedded environment where they um, have been used to um, having full control over their infrastructure to the point that when they need it, they get to bypass it. And that's, as an example, the way DPDK um, is, is serving their needs in order to cut uh, latencies, to eliminate jitter, and improve the performance of the platform altogether. So, uh, but there are other aspects of that that are important for me. When I start looking closer into a server, a modern server of today, I'll find that, duh, it's multiple core. It has a dual socket in, in you know, north of 80, 90 percent of the cases. Uh, there is difference whether uh, my NIC is really tied to this core or is really working on behalf of that core. And the memory that I'm using, is it really close or is it, is it uh, one hop away? And my performance is going to vary dramatically and the utilization of my platform along with uh, the cost of running that is going to vary dramatically. So what I want to do is be aware of that. I obviously don't want to do that as an application developer. I want to. I want to trust my orchestrator to do that for me. I want to trust my SDN controller to take care of the networking aspect of that. And the benefits of that are going to be, if I compare these, these two um, speedometers over here, the benefit is going to be something to the tune of this slide that you see here that was produced by a third party. If you are simply looking in a very um, artificial environment where this, this is the only variable we change between these two platforms, and there's nothing else running. As we talked about earlier, when you have more stuff running, it's even more complicated. This is the difference of what you get. It's a remarkable difference. So you need to be aware of that. We had public demos where this was shown. So to wrap it all up, given 57 seconds, um, 
ODL, uh, as a community, I think we took the right step um, in the last release by promoting uh, the ability of everybody to use that with the S3P. Really, uh, I think uh, for those of you who are involved with uh, active contribution, uh, it's really going to be beneficial if you get involved with this. Uh, we are doing that. We encourage you to do that too. Um, we promoted two use cases um, in this release. What do we need to do next? I gave you some hints of where we think we need to go. Maybe you have better ones. Please let us know. And obviously, use open daylight. Any questions? Three, two, one. Thank you very much. Oh, one question. <laughs> So it depends what you're trying to do. The gaps are going to show up in different places in the stack, depends on what you're trying to do. I, I was able in this time frame, in order to paint a broad picture for you, I was uh, just touching very lightly here and there. Uh, pretty much anything that you didn't have tested top to bottom is not going to work. I gave you one example of, um, say, SFC. Well. You absolutely can use it today with uh, Open Daylight and Open vSwitch. When I say absolutely can use it today, very careful with that st statement too. It's, it's working today. Does it scale? Does it uh, have a full control plane that you are going to need in your application? Well, obviously, you need to, to build on top of that, but that's what you expect from an open source project. Can I get it to work with OpenStack? As we go north, the Unfortunate uh, divergence um, is larger than it is as we stay uh, closer to the platform. So I think that uh, what you find is this, this triangle again, closer to the platform, ODL as the next layer next to the platform. I think as a community, we are doing a very reasonable job. Obviously, we could do much better. Um, as you start getting higher and higher in the stack, more players, more different directions, so uh, your mileage is going to vary. Any other questions? Okay, thanks everybody very much. In the interest of time, we'll simply start um, because there's uh, lots of stuff to cover in this uh, deck. Um, Really trying to describe Open Daylight from a slightly different angle and perspective uh, for you. Um, we'll cover a few of uh, the different things Open Daylight is useful for in the bigger context of, uh, of the whole um, kind of uh, OpenStack uh, reference. Many times in this conference, uh, we are looking um, how we're doing as a community, uh, what a specific project is doing, what do I have in this release or in that release. What I'm trying to cover here is um, something that is a little bit different, trying to um, kind of frame the boundary of what Open Daylight is doing in the bigger context of the whole stack. And we'll use some of the favorite um, use cases that have been pointed out by other folks here. Um, this week in order to do that. So just for an appetizer here uh, or to wake you up after uh, lunch or whatever, we'll talk about uh, service chaining as an example, but uh, really the bigger context is how applications are interacting. I do that not as a VM, but as actually a privileged function in the network that the rest of the infrastructure would really be able to identify and, as such, provided some privileges to the network. And we will touch on that. What does that mean to get privileged access to some of, of the network stuff? And in enterprise, um, similar, user, uh, similar use cases. And why are people looking into that? For reasons that have been already discussed, so I'm not going to uh, get into this right now. But. I want to take a step back first and 
look at uh, kind of, if you want, something that we refer to as software defined infrastructure that you are starting to hear more about in the industry, I think, right now. I just actually, a couple of days ago, so um, somebody is already organizing an SDI conference later this, this fall. And the idea is not just to look at network, but to look at network, compute, and storage in some sort of holistic fashion. Everything is driven by cloudification, which really means automation, which really means the agility, um, the ability to move uh, workloads um, at the speed of a mouse click based on a momentary needs. And, and when I start looking at Elco, or to cloud, or to enterprise, lots of the things we are doing here in this community are actually equivalently relevant to different market segments, even though the deployment and the ad adoption of that may vary um, on time. But when you look at telco, for instance, I think the uh, reasons people are interested in service chaining are kind of almost evident. You have different users, they have uh, different contracts, you may want to do stuff uh, per flow. For example, uh, telco has different types of network. Uh, they deploy stuff in different uh, kind of topologies, which by itself may create a need to do service chain either restricted to a topology, cross topologies, and so on and so forth. Um, in cloud, where all of this was born, it comes pretty naturally that you would like to have um, some firewalls, load balancer, when optimizers, whatever. And even you may want to think, even though um, some of your favorite cloud uh, management systems do not support it today that you want to bring your own. So I really like that firewall with that configuration. I really want that load balancer that is optimized for my application. I would be very happy to deploy it. Getting at things that way and looking at the application and then the different layers of, uh, there's no pointer here, I think. Maybe there is, no. <laughs> that was the wrong, wrong thing to push. Um, there is recovery. Okay. Not too much damage. Don't push buttons that you don't know what they're going to do. Um, is the lesson. So anyhow, uh, there are layers in, in the infrastructure. We, we are going to visit those orchestration. The control is, uh, thank you. Oh, is, is that the same? It's, it's going to work with this? Oh, oh, okay, oh, okay. Thank you, Asaf. Okay, okay. So um, the layers, uh, the different layers is actually going to be what we are going to talk about. Um, and you see at the bottom that ideally if I could organize all of my resources in a pool and at one moment this box in my infrastructure is more network centric and another moment it's going to be more storage centric. That would be uh, very interesting. It's going to lead to my ability at the business level to drive agility, to drive uh, lower cost, lower uh, capex and opex and so on. But we have some challenges before we get to this wonderful picture. What is with the infrastructure? Then we'll zoom into the different roles Open Daylight uh, can play, which is the key theme of this talk. And um, look at uh, now that we put some ideas behind how all of the different pieces of uh, the stack are there for us, when we put it all together, what do we really have today? What we still need to do in order to um, get more and the last subject is going to be specific to um, infrastructure awareness at higher layers and the benefit it provides, and then wrap it up with a call to actions. So this is just to uh, provide some example of how things are uh, potentially being used here. Uh, this uh, diagram is taken from uh, one of the um, Etsy uh, reference architectures, you see the different VNFs being connected up there, and um, the whole idea is I need some network activity, some network boxes that are going to sit between the uh, two endpoints. We want to 
carry with us some um, insight to the fact that service chaining is not really limited to